for the theory of property rights, Harold Demsetz. When a transaction is concluded in the marketplace, two bundles of property rights are exchanged. A bundle of rights often attaches to a physical commodity or service, but it is the value of the rights that determines the value of what is exchanged. Questions addressed to the emergence and mix of the components of the bundle of rights are prior to those commonly asked by economists. Economists usually take the bundle of property rights as a datum and ask for an explanation of the forces determining the price and the number of units of a good to which these rights attach. In this paper, I seek to fashion some of the elements of an economic theory of property rights. The paper is organized in three parts. The first part discusses briefly the concept and role of property rights in social systems. The second part offers some guidance for investigating the emergence of property rights. The third part sets forth some principles relevant to coalescing of property rights into particular bundles, and to the determination of the ownership structure that will be associated with these bundles. The concept and role of property rights. In the world of Robinson Crusoe, property rights play no role. Property rights are an instrument of society and derive their significance from the fact that they help a man form those expectations which he can reasonably hold in his dealing with others. These expectations find expressions in the law, customs and more of society. An owner of property rights possesses the consent of fellow men to allow him to act in particular ways. An owner expects the community to prevent others from interfering with his actions, provided that those actions are not prohibited in the specifications of his rights. It is important to note that property rights convey the right to benefit or harm oneself or others. Harming a competitor by producing superior products may be permitted. Why shooting him may not? A man may be permitted to benefit himself by shooting an intruder, but be prohibited from selling below a price floor. It is clear then that property rights specify how persons may be benefited and harmed, and therefore who must pay whom to modify the actions taken by persons. The recognition of this leads easily to the close relationship between property rights and externalities. Externality is an ambiguous concept. For the purpose of this paper, the concept includes external costs, external benefits, and pecuniary as well as non-pecuniary externalities. No harmful or beneficial effect is external to the world. Some persons or persons always suffer and enjoy these effects. What converts a harmful or beneficial effect into an externality is that the cost of bringing the effect to bear on the decisions of one or more of the interacting persons is too high to make it worthwhile. And this is what the term shall mean here. Internalizing such effect refers to a process, usually a change in property rights, that enables these effects to bear, in greater degree, on all interacting persons. The primary function of property rights is that of guiding incentives to achieve a greater internalization of externalities. Every cost and benefit associated with the social interdependencies is a potential externality. One condition is necessary to make costs and benefits externalities. The cost of transaction in the rights between the parties internalization must exceed the gains from internalization. In general, transacting costs can be large relative to gains because of natural difficulties in trading, or they can be large because of legal reasons. In a lawful society, the prohibition of voluntary negotiations makes the cost of transacting infinite. Some costs and benefits are not taken into account by users of resources whenever externality exists, but allowing transactions increase the degree to which internalization takes place. For example, it might be thought that a firm which uses slave labor will not recognize all the costs of its activities, since it can't have its slave labor by paying subsistent wages only. This will not be true if negotiations are permitted, for the slaves can offer to the firm a payment for their freedom based on the expected return to them of being free men. The cost of slavery can thus be internalized in the calculations of the firm. Transactions from serf to free men in feudal Europe is an example of this process. Perhaps one of the most significant cases of externalities is the extensive use of the military draft. The taxpayer benefits by not paying the full cost of staffing the armed services. The costs which he escapes are the additional sums that would be needed to acquire men voluntary for the services, or those sums that would be offered as payments by draftees to taxpayers in order to be exempted. With either voluntary recruitment, the buy him in system, or with the let him buy his way out system, the full cost of recruitment would be brought to bear on taxpayers. It would always seem incredible to me that so many economists can recognize an externality when they see smoke, but not when they see the draft. The familiar smoke example is one in which negotiation costs may be too high because of the large number of interacting parties.
to make it worthwhile to internalize all the effects of smoke. The draft is an externality caused by forbidding negotiation. The role of property rights in the internalization of externalities can be made clear within the context of the above examples. A law which established the rights of a person to his freedom would necessitate a payment on the part of a firm or of the taxpayer sufficient to cover the costs of using that person's labor if his services are to be obtained. The cost of labor does become internalized in the firm's or taxpayer's decision. Alternatively, a law which gives the firm or the taxpayer clear title to slave labor would necessitate that the slave owners take into account the sums that slaves are willing to pay for their freedom. These costs thus become internalized in decisions, although wealth is distributed differently in the two cases. All that is needed for internalization in either case is ownership which includes the rights of sale. It is the prohibition of property rights adjustment, the prohibition of the establishment of an ownership title that can thenceforth be exchanged that precludes the internalization of external costs and benefits. There are two striking implications of this process that are true in the world of zero transaction costs. The output mix that results when the exchange of property rights is allowed is efficient and the mix is independent of who is assigned ownership, except that different wealth distribution may result in different demands. For example, the efficient mix of civilians and military will result from transferable ownership no matter whether taxpayers must hire military volunteers or whether draftees must pay taxpayers to be excused from service. Or taxpayers will hire only those military under the Bahamian property rights system who will not pay to be exempted under the let him buy his way out system. The highest bidder under the let him buy his way out property rights system would be precisely the last to volunteer under a buy him in system. We will refer back to some of these points later, but for now enough groundwork has been laid to facilitate the discussion of the next two parts of this paper. The emergence of property rights. If the main allocative function of property rights is the internalization of beneficial and harmful effects, then the emergence of property rights can be understood best by their association with the emergence of new or different beneficial and harmful effects. Changes in knowledge result in changes in production functions, market values and aspirations. New techniques, new ways of doing the same thing and doing new things all invoke harmful and beneficial effects to which society has not been accustomed. It is my thesis in this part of the paper that the emergence of new property rights takes place in response to the desires of the interacting persons for adjustment to the new benefit-cost possibilities. The thesis can be restated in a slightly different fashion. Property rights develop to internalize externalities when the gains of internalization becomes larger than the cost of internalization. Increased internalization in the main results from changes in economic values, changes which stem from the development of new technology and the opening of new markets. Changes to which old property rights are purely attuned. A proper interpretation of this assertion requires that account be taken of a community's preference for a private ownership. Some communities will have less well-developed private ownership systems and more highly developed state ownership systems. But given a community's taste in this regard, the emergence of new private or state-owned property rights will be in response to changes in technology and relative prices. I do not mean to assert or to deny that the adjustment in property rights which take place need be the result of a conscious endeavor to cope with new externality problems. These adjustments have arisen in Western societies largely as a result of gradual changes in social mores and in common law precedents. At each step of this adjustment process, it's unlikely that externalities per se were consciously related to the issue being resolved. These legal and moral experiments may be hit on miss procedures to some extent, but in a society that weights the achievement of efficient heavily, their viability in the long run will depend on how well they modify behavior to accommodate to the externalities associated with important changes in technology or market values. A rigorous test of this assertion will require extensive and detailed empirical work. A broad range of examples can be cited that are consistent with it. The development of air rights, renters' rights, rules for liability in automobile accidents, etc. In this part of the discussion, I shall present one group of such examples in some detail. They deal with the developing of property rights in lands among American Indians. These examples are broad-ranging and come fairly close to what can be called convincing evidence in the field of anthropology. The question of private ownership of land among aboriginals has held a fascination for anthropologists. It has been one of the intellectual battlegrounds in the attempt to access the true nature of man unconstrained by the artificialities of civilization. In the process of carrying on this debate, information has been uncovered that bears directly on the thesis with which we are now concerned. What appears to be accepted as a classic treatment and a high point of this debate is Eleanor Leocock's 
memory on the Montagnese hunting territory and the fur trade. Leo Cox's research followed that of Frank G. Speck, who had discovered that the Indians of the Labrador Peninsula had a long-established tradition of property in land. This finding was at odds with what was known about the Indians of the American Southwest, and it prompted Leo Cox's study of the Montagnese, who inhabited the large regions around Quebec. Leo Cox clearly established the fact that a close relationship existed, both historically and geographically, between the development of private rights in land and the development of the commercial fur trade. The factual basis of this correlation has gone unchallenged. However, to my knowledge, no theory relating privacy of land to the fur trade has yet been articulated. The factual material uncovered by Speck and Leocock fits the thesis of this paper well, and in doing so, it reveals clearly the role played by property rights adjustment in taking account of what economists have often cited as an example of externality, the overhunting of game. Because of the lack of control over hunting by others, it is in no person's interest to invest in increasing or maintaining the stock of game. Overly intensive hunting takes place. The successful hunt is viewed as imposing external costs on subsequent hunters' costs. They are not taken into account fully in the determination of the extent of hunting and of animal husbandry. Before the fur trade became established, hunting was carried on primarily for purposes of food and the relative few furs that were required for the hunter's family. The externality was clearly present. Hunting could be practiced freely and was carried on without assessing its impact on other hunters. But these external effects were of such small significance that it did not pay for anyone to take them into account. There did not exist anything resembling private ownership in land. And in the Jesuit relations, particularly Jesuit's record of the winter he spent with the Montagnese in 1633 through 34, and in the brief account given by Father Drew Letts in 1647 through 48, Leocock finds no evidence of private land holdings. Both accounts indicate a socio-economic organization in which private rights to land are not well developed. We may safely surmise that the advent of the fur trade had two immediate consequences. First, the value of furs to the Indians was increased considerably. Second, and as a result, the scale of hunting activity rose sharply. Both consequences must have increased considerably the importance of the externalities associated with free hunting. The property rights system began to change, and it changed especially in the direction required to take account of the economic effect made important by the fur trade. The geographical distributional evidence collected by Leocock indicates an unmistakably correlation between early centers of fur trade and the oldest and most complete development of private hunting territory. By the beginning of the 18th century, we begin to have clear evidence that territorial hunting and trapping arrangements by individual families were developing their areas around Quebec. The earliest reference to such arrangements in this region indicates a purely temporary allotment of hunting territories. They, Algonquians and Iroquois, divide themselves into several bands in order to hunt more efficiently. It was their custom to appropriate piece of land around two leagues square for each group to hunt exclusively. Ownership of braver houses, however, had already become established, and when discovered, they were marked. A starving Indian could kill and eat another's beaver if he had left the fur and the tail. The next step toward hunting territory was probably a seasonal allotment system. An anonymous account written in 1723 states that the principles of the Indian is to mark off the hunting ground selected by them by blazing the trees with their crests so that they may never encroach on each other. By the middle of the century, those allotted territories were relatively stabilized. The principle that associates property right changes with the emergence of new and revaluation of old harmful and beneficial effects suggests in this instance that the fur trade made it economic to encourage the husbanding of fur-bearing animals. Husbanding requires the ability to prevent poaching, and this in turn suggests that socio-economic changes in property in hunting land will take place. The chain of reasoning is consistent with the evidence cited above. Is it inconsistent with the absence of similar rights and property among the southwestern Indians? Two factors suggest that the thesis is consistent with the absence of similar rights among the Indians of the southwestern plains. The first of these is that there were no plains animals of commercial importance comparable to the fur-bearing animals of the forest, at least not until the cattle arrived with the Europeans. The second factor is that animals of the plains are primarily grazing species whose habitat is to wander over wide tracts of land. The value of establishing boundaries to private hunting territories is thus reduced by the relative high cost of preventing the animals from moving to adjacent parcels. Hence, both the value and cost of establishing private hunting lands in the southwest are such that we could expect little development along these lines. The externality was just not worth taking into account. The lands of Labrador Peninsula shelter forest animals whose habits are considerably different from those of the plains. Forest animals confine their territories to relatively small areas, 
so that the cost of internalizing the effects of husbanding these animals is considerably reduced. This reduced cost, together with the higher commercial value of fur bearing in forest animals, made it productive to establish private hunting lands. Frank G. Speck finds that family property ship among the Indians of the peninsula included retaliation against trespass. Animal resources were husbanded. Sometimes conservation practices were carried on extensively. Family hunting territories were divided into quarters. Each year the family hunted in a different quarter in rotation, leaving a tract in the center as a sort of a bank, not to be hunted over unless forced to do so by shortage in the regular tract. To conclude our excursion into the phenomena of private rights in land among the American Indians, we note one further piece of corroborating evidence. Among the Indians of the Northwest, highly developed private family rights to hunting lands had also emerged, rights which went so far as to include inheritance. Here again we find that forest animals predominant and that the West Coast was frequently visited by sailing schooners whose primary purpose was trading in furs. Coalescing an ownership of property rights. I have argued that property rights arise when it become economic for those affected by externalities to internalize benefits and costs but I have not yet examined the forces which will govern the particular form of right ownership. Several idealized forms of ownership must be distinguished at the outset. These are communal ownership, private ownership, and state ownership. By communal ownership, I mean a right which can be exerted by all members of the community. Frequently, the rights to till and to hunt the land have been commonly owned. The right to walk in the city sidewalk is commonly owned. Communal ownership means that the community denies to the state or to the individual citizens the right to interfere with any personal exercise of community owned rights. Private ownership implies that the community recognizes the right of the owner to exclude others from exercising the owner's private rights. State ownership implies that the state may exclude anyone from the use of a right as long as the state follows accepted political procedures for determining who may not use state owned property. I shall not examine in detail the alternative of state ownership. The object of the analysis which follows is to discern some broad principles governing the development of property rights in communities oriented to private property. It will be best to begin by considering a particular useful example that focuses our attention on the problem of land ownership. Suppose that the land is commonly owned. Every person has the right to hunt, till, or mine the land. This form of ownership fails to concentrate the costs associated with any person's exercise of his communal right on that person. If a person seeks to maximize the value of his communal rights, he will tend to overhunt and overwork the land because some of the costs he's doing so are borne by others. The stock of game and the richness of the soil will diminish too quickly. It's conceivable that those who own these rights, it as every member of the community, can agree to curtail the rate at which they work in the land if negotiating and policing costs are zero. Each can agree to abridge his rights. It's obvious that the cost of reaching such an agreement will not be zero. What is not obvious is just how large this cost may be. Negotiating costs will be large because it's difficult for many persons to reach mutually satisfactory agreement, especially when each holdout has the right to work the land as fast as he pleases. But even if an agreement among all can be reached, we must yet take account of the cost of policing the agreement, and these may be large also. After such agreement is reached, no one will privately own the right to work the land. All can work the land but an agree upon shorter work week. Negotiating costs are increased even further because it's not possible under this system to bridge the full expected benefits and expected costs of future generations to bear on current users. If a single person owns land, he will attempt to maximize its present value by taking into account alternative future time streams of benefits and costs and selecting that one which he believes will maximize the present value of his privately owned land rights. You all know that this means that he will attempt to take into account the supply and demand conditions that he thinks will exist after his death. It's very difficult to see how the existing communal owners can reach an agreement that takes account of these costs. In effect, an owner of private rights to use land acts as a broker whose wealth depends on how well he takes into account the competing claims of the present and the future. But with communal rights there is no broker, and the claims of the present generation will be given an economically large weight in determining the intensity with which the land is worked. Future generations might desire to pay present generations enough to change the present intensity of land usage, but they have no living agent to place their claim on the market. Under community property rights, should the living person pay others to reduce the rate at which they work the land, he would not gain anything of value for his efforts. Community property means that future generations must speak for themselves. No one has yet estimated the cost of carrying such conversation. The land ownership example confronts us immediately with a great disadvantage of communal property. The effects of a person's activity on his neighbors and on subsequent generations will not be taken into account freely. Communal property results in great externalities. So 
a full cost of the activities of an owner of communion property rights are not borne directly by him, nor can they be called to his attention easily by the willingness of others to pay him an appropriate sum. Communion property rules out a pay to use the property system, and high negotiation and policy costs makes ineffective a pay him not to use this property system. The state, the courts, or the leaders of the community could attempt to internalize the external costs resulting from communion property by allowing private parcels owned by small groups of persons with similar interests. The logical groups in terms of similar interests are, of course, the family and the individual. Continuing with our use of the land ownership, Example, let us initiate distribute private titles to land randomly among existing individuals, and further let the extent of the land include in each title be randomly determined. The resulting private ownership of land will internalize many of the external costs associated with communal ownership. For now, an owner, by virtue of his power to exclude others, can generally count on realizing the rewards associated with husbanding, the game, and increasing the fertility of his land. This concentration of benefits and costs on owners creates incentives to utilize resources more effectively. But we have yet to contend with externalities. Under the communal property system, the maximization of the value of community property rights will take place without regard to many costs, because the owner of community rights cannot exclude others from enjoying the fruits of his efforts, and because the negotiation costs are too high for all to agree jointly on optimal behavior. The development of property rights permits the owner to economize on the use of those resources from which he has the right to exclude others. Much internalization is accomplished in this way, but the owner of property rights to one parcel does not himself own the rights to the parcel of another private sector. Since he cannot exclude others from private rights to land, he has no direct incentive in the absence of negotiation to economize in the use of his land in a way that takes into account the effects he produces on the land rights of others. If he constructs a dam on his land, he has no direct incentives to take into account the lower water levels produced on his neighboring land. This is exactly the same kind of externality that we have encountered with communal property rights, but it is present to a lesser degree. Whereas no one has incentives to store water on any land under the communal system, private owners now can take into account directly those benefits and costs to their land that accompany water storage. But the effects on the land of others will not be taken into account directly. Partial concentration of benefits and costs that accompany private ownership is only part of the advantage this system offers. The other part, and perhaps the most important, has escaped our notice. The cost of negotiation over the remaining externalities will be reduced greatly. Communal property rights allow anyone to use the land. Under the system, it becomes necessary for all to reach an agreement on land use, but the externalities that accompany private ownership of property do not affect all owners, and generally speaking, it will be necessary for only a few to reach an agreement that takes these effects into account. The cost of negotiating and internalization of these effects is thereby reduced considerably. The point is important enough to elucidate. Suppose an owner of communal land right, in the process of plowing a parcel of land, observes a second communal owner constructing a dam on adjacent land. The farmer prefers to have the stream as it is, and so he asks the engineer to stop his construction. The engineer says, pay me to stop. The farmer replies, I will be happy to pay you, but what can you guarantee in return? The engineer answers, I can guarantee you that I will not continue constructing the dam, but I cannot guarantee you that another engineer will not take up the task because this is communal property. I have no right to exclude him. What would be a simple negotiation between two persons under a private property arrangement turns out to be a rather complex negotiation between the farmer and everyone else. This is the basic explanation, I believe, for the preponderance of a single rather than multiple owners of property. Indeed, an increase in the number of owners is an increase in the commonality of property and leads generally to increasing the cost of internalizing. The reduction in negotiating costs that accompanies the private right to exclude others allows most externalities to be internalized at a rather low cost. Those that are not associated with the activities that generate the external effects impinging upon many people. The suit from the smoke affects many house owners, none of whom is willing to pay enough to the factory to get his owner to reduce the smoke output. All homeowners together will might be willing to pay enough, but the cost of their getting together may be enough to discourage effective market bargaining. The negotiation problem is compounded even more if the smoke comes out from not from a single smokestack, but from an industrial district. In such case, it may be costly to internalize effects through the marketplace. Returning to our land ownership paradigm, we recall the land was distributed in randomly sized parcels to randomly selected owners. These owners now negotiate among themselves to internalize any remaining externalities. Two market options are open to the negotiator. The first is simply to try to reach a contractual agreement among owners that directly deals with the external effects at issue. The second option is for some owners to buy out others, thus changing the parcel size owned. 
which option is selected will depend on which is cheaper. We have here a standard economic problem of optimal scale. If there exists a constant return to scale in the ownership of different size parcel, it will be largely a matter of indifference between outright purchase and contractual agreement, if only a single easy-to-policy contractual agreement will internalize the externality. But if there are several externalities, so that several such contracts will need to be negotiated, or if, the, if contractual agreements should be difficult to policy, then outright purchase will be the preferred course of action. The greater are these economies of scale to land ownership, the more will contractual arrangement will be used to interact in neighbors to settle this difference. Negotiating and policy costs will be compared to costs that depends on the scale of ownership, and parcels of land will tend to be owned in sites which minimize the sum of these costs. The interplay of scale economies, negotiating costs, externality, and the modification of property rights can be seen in the most notable exception to the assertion that ownership tends to be an individual affair, the publicly held corporation. I assume that significant economies of scale in the operation of large corporations is a fact, and also the large requirements for equity capital can be satisfied more cheaply by acquiring the capital from many purchases of equity shares. While economies of scale in operating those enterprises exist, economies of scale in the provision of capital do not, hence it becomes desirable for many owners to form a joint stock company. But if all owners participate in each decision that needs to be made by such a company, the scale economies of operating the company will overcome quickly by high negotiating costs. Hence, the delegation of authority for most decisions tell its place, and for most of these, a small management group becomes the de facto owners. Effective ownership, it has effective control of property, is thus legally concentrated in management's hand. This is the first legal modification, and it takes place in recognition of the high negotiation costs it would otherwise obtain. The structure of ownership, however, creates some externalities difficulties under the law of partnership. If the corporation should fail, partnership law commits each shareholder to meet the debt of the corporation up the limits of financial ability. Thus, managerial de facto ownership can have considerable external effects on shareholders. Should property rights remain unmodified, this externality would make it exceedingly difficult for entrepreneurs to acquire equity capital from wealthy individuals. Although these individuals have recourse to reimbursements from other shareholders, litigation costs will be high. A second legal modification limited liability has taken place to reduce the effects of this externality. The effect of management, ownership, and limited liability combine to minimize the overall cost of operating large enterprise. Shareholders are essentially leaders of equity capital and not owners, although they do participate in such infrequent decisions of those involved mergers. What shareholders really own are their shares and not the corporation. Ownership in the sense of control again becomes a largely individual affair. The shareholders own their shares, and the president of the corporation and possibly a few others top executives control the corporation. Further ease the impact of management decision on shareholders, that is, to minimize the impact of externalities under this ownership form, a further legal modification of rights is required. Unlike partnership laws, a shareholder may sell his interest without first obtaining the permission of fellow shareholders or without dissolving the corporation. It does become easy for him to get out his preference and those of the management are no longer in harmony. This escape hatch is extremely important and has given rise to organized trading of securities. The increase in harmony between managers and shareholders brought about by exchange and by competing managerial groups help to minimize the external effect associated with corporate ownership structure. Finally, limited liability considerably reduces the cost of exchanging shares by making it necessary for a purchaser of shares to examine in great detail the liability of the corporation and the assets of other shareholders. This liability can adversely affect a purchaser only up to the extent of the price per share. The dual tendency of for ownership to rest with individuals and for the extent of an individual's ownership to accord with the minimization of all costs is clear in the land ownership paradigm. The applicability of this paradigm has been extended to the corporation, but it may not be clear yet how widely applicable this paradigm is. Consider the problems for copyright and patents. If a new idea is freely appropriate by all, if there exist communal rights to new ideas, incentives for developing such ideas will be lacking. The benefits derivable from these ideas will not be concentrated on their originators. If we extend some degree of private rights to the originators, this idea will come further at a more rapid pace. But the existence of the property rights does not mean that their effects on the property of others will be directly taken into account. A new idea makes an old one obsolete, and another old one more valuable. These effects will not be directly taken into account, but they can be called to the attention of the originator of the new idea through market negotiations. All problems of externalities are closely analogous to those which arise in the land ownership example. The relevant variables are identical. What I have suggested in this paper is an approach to the problems in property rights, but it is more than that. It is also a different way of viewing traditional problems. 
An elaboration of this approach will, I hope, illuminate a great number of socioeconomic problems. The end. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.